Hey YouTube, if you've used dynamic arrays, aka vectors, or other data structures in your code, as I'm sure you have, you might have run into this method, reserve. This is a powerful tool for pre-allocating memory right before adding a bunch of elements to your data structure, which can be a great low-hanging performance optimization for your code. But just like all powerful tools, if used incorrectly, it can be dangerous. In this one, we'll talk about what reserve is good for and when and where you should definitely use it, but also, if you're using it incorrectly, how it might be destroying your performance. So this destroying your performance issue is very personal to me because I initially ran into it when I wrote some code that was supposed to be fast but was very not fast, and I was very confused until I learned why. This was in a Rust code base, but I've also run into it in a C++ code base that was using the standard library, and I most recently ran into it in the Unreal Engine code base, which is also a C++ code base, while I was working on one of my other videos. So this is a cross-cutting concern, and it doesn't matter what language you're in, it's fundamental to the design of the dynamic array data structure. But as it so happens, these are my two favorite programming languages, so I'm going to kind of be talking about both in this video. But in order to do that, I'll need to define my terms. So when I say reserve, I'll be referring to a method on a data structure that changes the data structure's capacity, in other words, pre-allocates memory, to hold n elements, or does nothing if n is less than the current capacity. In particular here, this method reserves memory for exactly n elements, regardless of the current size of the data structure. In C++, the reserve method on std vector has this behavior. Now, to be pedantic, the C++ standard doesn't actually guarantee this behavior. It allows implementations to reserve space for more than n elements, but I checked all three major standard library implementations, and they all just reserve space for n elements. Also, as I hinted, I'll be talking about Unreal Engine very briefly, and their dynamic array is called tarray, and its reserve method also has the same behavior by default. Now in Rust, the standard method that has this behavior is reserve exact on VEC. VEC actually has a reserve method too that does something similar but doesn't have the issue that I'm going to be talking about, for reasons I'll explain later. So in this video, when you see reserve in yellow, I'm talking about this method that reserves the exact amount of memory that you asked for. And just keep in mind that in Rust, that method is actually called reserve exact. Sorry if this is a little complicated. In this video, I'm talking about a method that's usually good, but sometimes bad across two languages where it's called different things. And in C++, its behavior is not technically guaranteed. Oh, and one more thing. In Rust, it's not, I want capacity for n total elements. It's, I want capacity for n additional elements. Anyway, I hope this all isn't too confusing. I'll try to be as clear as possible. So let's set the stage by looking at the code in Unreal Engine that made me want to make this video. So I was poking around in Unreal, looking at this class useBlindComponent, which basically describes a curve in 3D space that passes through some points that you give it, and you can use it for all sorts of cool stuff. For my use case, I was looking to build one of these up programmatically by adding points gradually as I computed them in a loop. So I gravitated toward this pair of APIs, add point for adding one, and add points for adding multiple. Now, at first glance, it might seem strange that there's both. I mean, if we have add point, can't we just call it in a loop? Why do we need to add points? Well, it's possible that add points is just a convenience, but when I see this API, especially in a game engine that's highly focused on performance, it makes me think that the fact that they decided it was worth implementing an entire separate method for adding multiple points must mean that they're doing something better in the implementation that we can't do ourselves just by calling add point in a loop. Side note, it's a little unfortunate that this points parameter is a T array. This means that to add multiple points, you first have to stick them all on the heap in a dynamically allocated array. That's because Unreal doesn't have anything like a lazy iterator abstraction or generic views into contiguous memory like C++'s std span or Rust slices as part of its core design. So you have to put these points on the heap. That makes this method and others like it more expensive than they need to be, which is too bad, especially because my hunch is that this method is here to improve performance for bulk operations. Anyway. What could add points be doing internally that's so interesting? Well, let's take a look. So here's the body of add points. It's pretty simple. There's this update spline stuff, which is a little optimization that we could have also done ourselves that does some expensive math just once at the very end instead of for each and every point. But the bulk of this function is just a loop that calls add point with each of our points. So why do we need a special method for this? Why couldn't we have just done this ourselves? Well, take a look just above the loop. Before the loop, this function calls reserve on a private internal data structure to warn it in advance about the number of points we're about to add. And this seems really smart. We have a handful of points, we're going to add them all, so we might as well pre-allocate enough space for them all up front. 
But as good as this idea sounds on paper, it is actually fairly dangerous to have this reserve in here. Depending on your usage pattern of your spline, this reserve call might give your code quadratic complexity and increase the number of reallocations instead of reducing them. I'll explain how and why, and I'm also not necessarily saying that Unreal Engine is doing anything wrong here. It's possible this reserve is a good fit for their use cases, but when you are designing your APIs, this is something you should be aware of. And I'll explain it, but first, let's just review what reserve is supposed to do, what problems it's supposed to solve, and what the intention is behind putting it in a spot like this. So let's look at an example. Here's some pseudocode that creates an empty vector and then pushes the numbers 1 through 7 into it. Let's look at what this code is going to do behind the scenes. So we start out with our vector object on the stack, just empty. And a vector is made up of a pointer to its heap data, its current length, and its current capacity. An empty vector isn't going to allocate memory, so it's going to have a capacity of 0. That means that the pointer will be pointing at nothing. In C++, this fact will probably be represented as a null pointer, which is great, because it means that a default constructed vector will have a bit representation of all zeros, making it very simple and cheap to construct. In Rust, on the other hand, the pointer will instead be a non-null dangling pointer, so that the compiler can use all zeros as a niche for layout optimizations. So different decisions there with different pros and cons. Now let's push our elements. When we go to push 1, the vector needs to allocate memory to hold it. Let's say that it allocates memory for exactly one element, although in reality your vector implementation and or your allocator might give you more, especially if your elements are small. We move our one into the allocated buffer and update our vector's length and capacity bookkeeping data. Now, when we go to push two, we immediately have to allocate memory again. We allocate a larger buffer, move the existing one from the old buffer to the new, point at the new buffer, update our capacity, destroy the old buffer, and then finally move two into the new buffer. Then we go to push three and something interesting happens. We allocate more than enough space for our three. That's because vector isn't just allocating enough room for one new element on each push. It's actually doubling its current capacity each time. We'll see why shortly. For now, notice that when we push four, we don't need to reallocate. When we get to five, we double the capacity again for a total of eight. The next two elements sail straight to the vector without a reallocation. We end up with a vector with all of our elements and one spare slot at the end for adding one more element without reallocating if we want to. So for a quick digression, we need to talk about this doubling thing if the rest of the video is going to make sense. So this doubling of the capacity every time is known as exponential growth, sometimes called geometric growth, which has interesting consequences for algorithmic complexity. In particular, it means that push operations, or pushback as it's known in C++, have this complexity, which is pronounced amortized constant complexity. Now, when I first learned this, I was confused because it sure seemed like some of our push operations just now did some stuff that felt like linear time complexity. There are many ways to show that this is true, though, including mathematically proving it. But here's a quick informal illustration that helps it click for me. So think back to just now when we were pushing 5. Pushing 5 caused a reallocation. So the cost of pushing 5 was the cost of moving 5 into our new buffer and also moving the numbers 1 through 4 from the old buffer to the new buffer. But once we paid that big cost up front, the next few pushes did not have to pay it again. They only had to pay the constant cost of moving their respective elements into the buffer. We didn't actually push 8, but if we had, that would have had a constant cost too. So when we pushed 5, we sort of paid part of the cost of pushing 6, 7, and 8 up front. When we look at this series of operations as a group, we can sort of divide the linear cost of pushing 5 among all the times we didn't have to do it afterward. From this angle, each push pays off the cost of moving one of the elements from the old buffer to the new last time we reallocated. And this is what we mean by amortized constant complexity. Any individual push viewed in isolation might have linear complexity, but when you view the pushes as a series of operations, it evens out and it's as if each one had constant complexity. Note finally that when we go to push nine, we have to reallocate again, but that's okay. The cost of our last reallocation is fully paid off by the time we get to nine. And in fact, because we're doubling every time, that will always be true. Each time we need to reallocate, the previous reallocation will have been fully paid off. Now, specifically doubling isn't essential though. The growth just needs to be a factor of the current size. 
Choosing a good growth factor is an important part of tuning your vector implementation. And in fact, there's some research to suggest that two is actually a bad choice, but that's beyond the scope of this video. I encourage you to look up FB vector in Facebook's Folly library for more info. Link in the description. All right, digression over. What can we do better in that example we just saw? Well, two things. First, we know exactly how many elements we're going to push into the vector before we do. So we should just give the vector a heads up about that before we start, so it doesn't need to keep reallocating memory as we're pushing elements. We also ended up with some extra capacity at the end we might not have a use for, and that costs us some memory overhead. Maybe we can just feed two birds with one scone. Let's call reserve, the yellow one, before our loop. This looks a lot like what you would write in C++. In Rust, you'd probably just use the with capacity constructor on vec to make this a one-liner. So let's see what this looks like now. We start out with our same empty vector and our same elements we want to push. But the first thing we do is call reserve to allocate space for exactly seven elements. Now we can just move all of our elements directly into this buffer without any intermediate reallocations. And at the end, we're left with a buffer that is perfectly sized with no extra spare capacity at the end, modulo any subtleties of our memory allocator. So this is great and perfect and exactly what reserve is designed to do. Use it in this situation. More precisely, use reserve or reserve exact if you know how many things are going to end up in your data structure. In my experience, it's most useful right after you create an empty vector, right before you push a bunch of things onto it in a loop. As we saw, those early pushes can cause lots of reallocations if you haven't called reserve. So it can be a great tool for getting rid of those. So if it's so great, how can it go wrong? Well, to answer that, let's look at some pseudocode that mirrors the add points function from Unreal that we saw earlier. This function, bulk append, takes in some elements and calls reserve on some vector it has, called v, before pushing the elements onto that vector in a loop. Seems reasonable. Now let's imagine that we're calling this function from our code. And let's imagine that our algorithm in our business logic produces values two at a time via this get next to elements function, which let's assume has constant complexity. In the Unreal Curve example, imagine that this function returns the next point we want to use, along with also that same point mirrored about some axis for some kind of interesting effect. After getting those next two points, we pass them into bulk append to stick them in our data structure. Let's look at what happens behind the scenes when we execute this code. So first off, we don't necessarily know the state of the vector inside bulk append before we enter our loop. It's some vector that survives between calls to bulk append, so it could very well already have some stuff in it from before our loop. So let's assume that it does. Now we enter our loop. We produce two elements, and the first thing that bulk append does is call reserve on the vector. Note that reserving is linear in the current size of the vector, so all the existing elements have to be moved to the new allocation. Then we move our elements in. Now the next two elements come in, and we have to do the same thing again. In fact, we're going to have to do this for every single pair of elements that comes in. We're going to have to reserve and reallocate every single time, causing a linear time operation for every single pair. The fatal flaw here boils down to the fact that at our call site, we are calling bulk append in a linear time loop, and the reserve inside of bulk append is causing the vector's capacity to grow linearly rather than exponentially like we saw before which effectively makes our pushes linear instead of amortized constant. These two ingredients make it so that our loop has quadratic complexity. And this reserve call that was supposed to reduce unnecessary reallocations is actually leading to way more frequent reallocations. So the bottom line is this, don't call reserve in a loop. Because if you do, you're thwarting your vector's efforts to grow efficiently for you. And this gets to the heart of the issue, but it also isn't the most helpful piece of advice I mean, we didn't call reserve in a loop in our example. We just wrote a loop that ended up calling reserve through a layer of abstraction. So it's up to the person writing that layer of abstraction to protect their users from this. How? Well, my advice is, if you're writing a public API and you're operating on a vector that you got by reference, whether that's literally through a function parameter or through a this pointer or a self-reference or anywhere else, don't use reserve or reserve exact in Rust, because you don't know what else your caller might be planning to do with their vector, and it might include calling your function again, maybe even in a loop. And if you've used reserve, you'll be setting them up for a bad time. To put it another way, reserve is best for vectors that are local variables or that are part of private APIs where you have full knowledge of the vector's usage characteristics and can be sure that you won't fall victim to this issue. But 
For your public APIs, what should you do instead? Surely we need a way to append multiple elements at a time, possibly pre-allocating if necessary, while preserving your vector's geometric growth. Well, in Rust, it looks something like this. This is the behavior of the regular reserve method in Rust. And it's why I said that Rust's reserve doesn't have this issue about quadratic complexity. It reserves while maintaining exponential growth, unlike reserve exact. But if you didn't know about this distinction between reserve and reserve exact, that might be because it's more idiomatic in Rust in cases like this to just not use reserve at all. Methods like extend already have library machinery to specialize on the iterator type they're given and pre-allocate memory if possible. Unlike with a series of pushes, there's no need to explain to the vec that you're about to add multiple elements before you call extend. Since extend is just one function call, it has all the information it needs to pre-allocate for you just as well as you could manually. Now what about C++? There are a couple ways to do it. One of them starts like this. You use the resize method rather than the reserve method. This actually changes the length of the vector, not just its capacity, and it does that by default constructing elements at the end. We can then copy over the new elements into those new slots, overwriting those default constructed elements. You can either use a handwritten loop or, my personal preference, an STL algorithm. Here I'm using std copy along with some move iterators to make sure the new elements get move assigned into their new slots. You don't have to use move iterators if your type is like trivially copy assignable, but I like using them to document that I'm like draining a vector into another vector. Anyway, this approach works, but it has some definite downsides. It's a little cumbersome and it requires that your type be default constructible, but it does preserve your vector's geometric growth because the resize method uses the vector's regular growth strategy, whereas reserve circumvents the growth strategy. Anyway, if this were all I was doing, I would not write it this way. I'd write it another way I'll show you in a sec. But I'm showing this way to highlight the shape of it, which can be useful, in particular because you can replace std copy with another algorithm of your choice. For example, std transform, which lets you run each element through a function before it lands in its final position in the vector. If you do just want to append the elements verbatim, though, it's much simpler just to insert your range of elements at the end of the vector. This overload of insert takes a range of elements and sticks them wherever you tell it, in this case the end, while preserving the vector's geometric growth. And just like Rust's extend, it will look at the iterator types you give it and try its best to determine how much space to pre-allocate before it starts inserting any elements. This method is generally the tool you want to reach for for appending in bulk to vectors or really any containers in C++. So in summary, if you want to append in bulk, use an API designed for appending in bulk. Don't try to re-implement it yourself using reserve. So we started this discussion with Unreal. Let's finish with Unreal 2. So what tools does T-Array give us to mitigate these issues? There are a couple of APIs that mirror the APIs we saw in std vector, and also many more, some of which are fairly advanced and potentially dangerous, but really let you unlock performance if you use them well. With these methods in mind, it's possible that use spline components add points method could benefit from another look to see if it's worth making a change. I've also glossed over some of the details of the add point method that gets called in this loop, and I haven't studied all the intricacies of what it's doing. What I do know is, well, the world gets better when we all work together to make it better. And I know that Unreal Engine accepts contributions. Maybe I'll do some more research and then send them a patch. Or if you're watching this, maybe you can. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you learned some stuff about Reserve, but more broadly, I hope you enjoyed diving deep into this data structure that's so fundamental to our craft and seeing how two world-class programming languages have designed their implementations of it. I hope you leave me a comment and I'll see you next time.